Hi, we are here with St. Lotus. I'm Mark Kederberg, and on the f virtual line, we have Mason talking through uh, the deck that I drafted for the last Friends and Family draft. We're calling it St. Lotus 14.5, because it was after the last St. Lotus. Uh, and yeah, I got to draft Oko's Funtime Crew. Yeah, absolutely. It looked like a lot of fun. Uh, it seemed like everyone drafted some pretty cool decks and, and had a good time. I heard uh, you guys drafted on uh, one night and then played the matches out the following day. Yeah, it's a format that I like a lot more. Uh, you get to just focus on the draft for Friday night. Uh, you spend a bunch of time actually going through the draft. Uh, and, and at the end of it, everyone goes home, prints their decks, does it however they want, and brings it back, and you get to play the matches the next day. It also makes it a little less grueling, because instead of a 12-hour straight event, it ends up being a four-hour event followed by a six- or seven-hour event, um, which yeah, is still very, very cool. tiring, like but a yeah, a little, a little mm -hmm. less, uh, less brutal. Yeah, we've done uh, some in Chicago kind of the same way, where we took you know plenty of time drafting, et cetera, et cetera, but then when we met up, we could just play the, the matches all at once. Kind of fun. Totally. So uh, how did the draft go? Who who won? Uh, yeah, so Brandon ended up taking it down. I can pull up the matches here. Brandon Curry. What yeah. a killer that guy is. It oh, was yeah. a really tight one, though. Uh, we have two five, or yeah, we have three five twos that came out of it. Um, oh, wow. Uh, and, uh, and, and like, I was 4-3 and ended up getting into the top on breakers. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it was, just, it was a really tight field all around. And I think that my deck probably underperformed a little bit where it should have been. Mm -hmm. um, but we also had a few new people coming in. Steven tried some really crazy stuff that ended up not working mm -hmm. out for him so well. Uh, and, <laughs> I can see that. Yeah. And I think Sam's deck also underperformed where it actually should have been. Her deck turned sure. out pretty well. But, no, overall it was, like, a pretty tight field here. Nobody went 7-0. Nobody ran away with the thing. No kidding. I mean, just those match scores, 4-3, four, 4-3, three, four, three, four, three, five, two, five, two, five, two. I mean, that's a, that's about as tight as it gets, obviously, Steven and Sam not having the best days. But, hey, you know, you swing for the fences sometimes, you, you strike out. It happens. And, and they were both trying things that were pretty far out of the wheelhouse, I think. Um, Steven, in particular, mm -hmm. was trying, like, the Basking Brood Scale combo. Um, mm. And it was a cool one. I think yeah. it, he's, he's tried these kind of, like, green-black creature combo strategies before. And I feel like there's uh -huh. something there, and as soon as he figures it out in this, like, junk-style deck, it's going to end up just, like, going nuts. But he's still, like, sorting out how it works with all the interaction and balancing all of that stuff along with the combo is hard. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, let me ask you a little bit about your draft. Yeah. Uh, let's get into it. So, uh, going into this, how much time did you spend uh, thinking about a strategy or, or a plan or a game plan? So I know you're usually a guy who, who thinks about these things a little bit. Yeah, this is like one of the decks that I've had in the back of my mind for a while. And it's, it's, I think we chatted about this the night before the draft. And this, I think, was my E deck. I'm like on the list of uh, decks I have. Actually, I have a bunch of uh, my prep docs down here. And you can see that the, the deck I ended up falling into is was literally not even on here. Uh, it kind of fell into this Oath and Tell archetype, archetype. But it was not uh, like when I pulled this up, this is the, the prep document I had for this. I had a lot of it in my head. So it's not like it, it was completely blank. But written down on paper, there was zero picks written down for this. But it's a deck I thought a lot about. It's like Flash, Oath, and Show and Tell. I um, feel like sure. the things that all work really well together. And that's what I fell into. Um, I, now, you've done how many of these BRDs now? Uh, high single digits, probably. I, I've, not, I've not done nearly as many as Steven or you. Um, but because I'm often just like watching them. But the probably like five or six at this point. And correct me if I'm wrong, but haven't you drafted a lot of like stormy combo decks and stuff? Correct. Yeah. Stuff? Almost always I almost always I play something, not necessarily Storm, but something that's like Doomsday or Thassa's Oracle style wins. I did have I usually uh -huh. have a Storm finisher in there as well, but um yeah, I tend to go combo or nothing. And this yep. is kind of a combo deck. I don't know how you how you consider um like flashing and show and telling and things, but Sure. I think it's uh, an interesting thing to think about because, you know, you might have these game plans going in, but once, you know, combat is engaged yeah. and you have to start thinking on the fly, I think a lot of people default to just things that they know. Correct. Um, so I think well, it's that, pretty interesting. I really wanted to. <laughs> it's just like something you haven't drafted before necessarily, but like you were just like, yes, this is this is where I can go to. I've got this. I, I have a plan. Right. I mean, the deck I really wanted to do was a Ruby Storm, just mono red uh, Storm deck, and red and mm. green realistically. Um, but that's a lot of fun. It would have been super cool, but then LED got sniped in the third round, and it shut down all that plan. So I had I had four decks prepped that all relied on Lion's Eye Diamond, and I had three decks prepped that relied on Urza Saga, and Sam took those Oof. two and three. So oh. it forced me into this deck, which didn't yeah. rely on either of those things. 
Yeah, so you wound up in seat seven, right? Correct, um, yeah. Uh, and right strangely, I, I got to... seat seven on pick five, right? So the pick order was very strange, but I ended up with pick seven. Interesting. And how do you like that? How it, how does that scale on your uh, preferred seat list? I think it's my fifth favorite seat. Um, I think my picks would go one, two, three, eight, seven. Um, one, two, three, and seven. That yeah, makes sense to me. But yeah, I don't know. Well, get, seven get, and eight seats are kind of nice since you get the double power pick. You know, you get the yes. double fast mana, you get the crypt and the, the soul ring and the mox or whatever. Yeah, kind it, of a nice it's, it's, Steven always talks about how he doesn't like the double mox pick. Um, I think he's mostly wrong, but I think that for the types of decks that he likes to draft, that might actually be correct. Um, it sounds very wrong. It sounds completely insane. I think his point um, is that something I, like White Bloom Adventurer might be better than a Mox uh, once you are already there. But I don't, I don't know. if Once you already have one Mox. Controver controversial take. My God. Yes. But hey, you know what? Maybe uh, if I get a chance to talk to Steven, we can wrestle around with that idea a little bit. I mean, <laughs> speaking of, I mean, Daniel Cardno. Cardno? Is Cardno. Yep. Yeah. This, is, this was his uh, first draft as well. Eight seemed to apparently agree with Steven as he picked uh, Thalia Guardian of Thraben in the eighth seat. And yeah, he... second pick and gave you the second mox. You had to be pretty excited about that. I was. Um, once I got the second mox, I was like, all right, well, uh, if I can manage to catch the... I, I was still at this point thinking I'm going to be in Ruby Storm because that was a, a base uh -huh. red deck. And I was like, hey, I got a mox Ruby and a mox Emerald. That might mean that I need less pressure on my Ancient Tomb. Um, I was really excited about the direction of that at this point. But then Lion's Eye Diamond got taken and before it even got back to me. And I was planning on taking that card around like 10th or 11th. So um, when Lion's Eye Diamond got taken, I'm just like, okay, well, I'm off that list at this point. Because without Lion's Eye Diamond, that deck gets incredibly hard to make work. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because so much of it's relying on being able to pitch LEDs and uh, you can even breach it back and all sorts of other things that make it nice. Um, and yeah, Breach instead, LED is a pretty classic combo. Yeah, so, so then I was like, oh, all right, well, if I have Mox Ruby and Mox Emerald, I probably want a Minskin Boo. Uh, so that, that's where I fell into. It's like Minskin Boo and Oko mm -hmm. are the two best cards. Mm -hmm. uh, and from there, I was like, I'll just draft Rug uh, and be aiming straight for Show and Tell as the deck at this point. I like that. So in these first few picks, you said you got Saga taken from you, you got LED taken from you. Uh, Time Walk didn't get picked until the third round. Time walk did not get picked until the third round. Thing. Did you pick? I'm just looking at how this worked. Did you pick? I, I picked Emerald over Time you Walk. You did not get a chance to pick Correct. Time Walk, right? Okay. If Daniel had taken Emerald the way I think a lot of people would assume he mm -hmm. would, would you have taken Time Walk uh, in that seventh pick? No, in that pick I would have or taken would Urza have taken Saga. Urza Saga, yeah. Yeah. Um, you kind of have to figure that card goes in the second round most of the time. Correct. Yeah. I think. So it makes sense. Uh, but then, man, just Time Walk got floated by the guy with Ancestral Recall. Absolutely wild. Um, yeah. Coming out of these first few rounds, uh, you had basically decided you were going to be playing Rug Good Stuff. Yeah, so. after it got back to me for my third pick, I, I knew that I was in the Show and Tell list. So I had its mm. Flash, Show and Tell, Oath of Druids are kind of the three cards that are going to define the archetype. Um, mm -hmm. And with that, obviously, Oko and Minskin Boo are incredible because they don't count as creatures, but they still defend you. Um, yeah, and then I was just basically being like, let's be a big blue control deck. Uh, so I've already have things that need colorless mana. Mana Drain was the follow up from that point. I think this Mana Drain is actually like pretty early and not needed there. Um, I don't know mm -hmm. what I would have taken yep. instead. Like, I don't know. Losing out Chrome Mox was annoying later on. I was still not thinking my art, my uh, land density is high enough for Mox Diamond, but I, I did definitely mm -hmm. feel like I could have used more fast mana in this deck. That's interesting. Do you are you the kind of person that likes to play Chrome Mox in your like fair mid range decks or your your uh, I like four mana Planeswalker decks? I don't know how to describe this. As, yeah. I, to me, this looks like a somewhat fair deck um, um, or like a somewhat mid rangey kind of deck. I would have liked it in my deck a lot, uh, but I think that in a general like I'm attacking with things and beating down deck like with running Lelia's generally not liking Chrome Mox, but in this one particularly because I uh, I want to get a turn one Oath of Druids if possible. Uh, like just getting turn one out the druids uh, is incredibly strong, and similarly, like getting a turn one or two show and tell is also incredibly strong. So that would be where my head is around why I want it. Um, I, I don't think you want it in a fair deck, but given that this deck is fundamentally trying to do unfair things and has a fair backup plan with the planeswalkers, uh, mm. yeah. I, also, being able to play your um, play whatever big banger you're doing and hold up one blue mana with all these one mana counter spells was a big part of the plan as well. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, to be honest, that that makes a lot of sense. How did you decide which? Uh, so you knew you were going to be doing oath show and tell flash stuff, and I see here it looks like the first big creature that you picked was Archon of Cruelty. Why yeah. Archon of Cruelty in round ten? Like it seemed like it came kind of out of nowhere for people. Right. So Cody this is I think picking reanimate. I think was the only thing that maybe would have led anyone to believe i remember in the chat that was kind of going on at the time while you mm -hmm. guys were starting i was very confused but it's our kind of cruelty pick so what what were you thinking when you decided so to move there the pick that i like even less is this fable to mirror breaker it was the worst card in my deck by a long shot uh, i took it because i got scared based on the uh based on cody being so far into red i was like what's the best red card uh fable to mirror breaker i grabbed that um i think it was really bad like it plays badly with show and tell or with uh oath and druids and it also has a strategy that's just like not this deck which is chip damage um it's not what i wanted to do so that's the card i hated mm -hmm. the archon though i took because attracts got taken and when attracts got taken i'm like i still want to be flash i want all of my cre all of my big threats to be flashable um so i'm thinking i need archon cruelty ashen rider and a bunch of other things but if mm -hmm. in my head cody was going into a straight up reanimator strategy and i wanted to cut that because i couldn't do things like play ember cool and uh and play ulamog and play all the big titans because uh, had Channel been taken yet? Channel also got taken. So I was scared because Sam was going to be taking the big Eldrazi. And now I see Cody is taking the big monsters. So I wanted to take the monsters mm -hmm. that uh, that Cody is taking because I couldn't get the ones Sam is taking. Later on, Cody that takes Flash and it ends, up, it ends up screwing that all up, that whole plan. But that's the reason for the Archon. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it seems like you wound up with a lot of big eldrazi and gristlebrand and things like that Correct. that are all great with show and tell none of which are good with flash so, right you, really, that, that's um, the thing once flash got taken make... i was i was freed up to move that direction so i don't take those yeah. until after flash is already gone uh, you know obviously you're missing some things like uh maybe some extra fast mana an ancient tomb correct um some things like that that you would normally see in like a legacy sneak and show deck circle like 20 well it might even still be how those, how those decks play if sneak and shows even a playable deck anymore, but I, it's been a minute i will say that sneak play. attack was a, a mistake i shouldn't have taken it i think that it uh i think, think if so. i just leaned harder towards oath of druids and and still having the show and tell because you show and tell you can drop in um you, you you can still like drop in one of those big things if you happen to have one in hand uh, mm -hmm. But I think that the sneak attack would just, it was too much of a color commitment. It cost five mana to use versus three. Um, and it also just forced me into a higher density of creatures where I had to have four of these big monsters instead of just instead of just having like two of them um, that you could do off of Oath of Druids. That makes, that makes sense to me. Now, Oath of Druids as a card mm -hmm. is a little bit more contextual. Um, you had Forbidden Orchard in your deck, yeah? The I classic did, of course. vintage oath combo. There's so um, many ways to activate Oath but... of Druids, especially with Into the Flood Maw, uh, Strict Serenade, and uh, whatever the other bird maker is. Um, mm -hmm. Where's that other. Swan Song. Yeah, I, I actually I don't think I should have run Into the Flood Maw. I think Chain of Vapor would have been better. Um, but I ran it because I was trying to lean towards the oath. Uh, it ended up costing me a game because I couldn't bounce my own thing. Oh, wow. but... Interesting. So, I mean, you did have a very strong idea that like i don't care if this person's not playing any creatures in their deck i'm going to oath druids them anyway totally yeah and then in the creature matchup you just can't lose it's kind of the idea no, if you can get your oath but that's obviously the problem is like oath is a one-off in this deck and there's no tutors for it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the classic it's so hard to build your deck around a single enchantment it's like the yes. uh the allurin problem it's the worst uh, i know so many people who are like guys oh my god we could i i've come up with a sick allurin list and it's like great step one how are you gonna get allurin in your hand every game right. yeah it's like unless you're uh, an enlightened tutor that's enlightened it. tutor and you know that's kind of it um let me see where did um vampiric tutor it went and super vampiric early tutor went in the in the first colored spell that Stephen Hagen picked, wow. Yes. And then I assume Demonic Tutor came uh, a couple rounds later. Um, yeah, going four color isn't a thing I'm ever four. looking to do, really. I you are uh, you are a man of few colors, and I respect that about you, even if I find it to be cowardly. Because it, you it end is. up with so many lands in your deck. My deck, my mana was have... freaking incredible. Yes. Mm -hmm. You have one, two, three, four fetch lands. Four fetch lands so and all three of the. Basically, give you access to whatever you want. Correct, so including the. So do you not the... think there's anything outside of of rug that you were missing out on? Probably. Um, um, I, I mean, I, even 
enlightened tutor, like, or to find your oath of druids or your sneak attack. Is that not a, a thought that crossed your mind? It did, but by, by, by the time that like enlightened tutor went, uh, it was not. It was it was not super late. So like, I was thinking about enlightened tutor. Oh, no, in thirty eighth, I'm just super wrong. Um, I was thinking about it, but at that point, I'm like, do I want to spend effectively three picks on it, right? Because I would want to get a white source, uh, probably two white sources, and then a lightning tutor. Um, and Very it possible. literally only gets oath, I believe. I'm not sure. Let me double check that. It gets oath. Sneak attack too, arguably. Yeah, but oh, the sneak attack is really bad. Um, and then you can grab artifacts too, but considering you're only playing the Moxen, that uh, yeah. makes sense enough. I could see There's totally like you could do swapping the things. Flash, because you could grab like a triplicate titan or some big idiot. Maybe like a blightsteel colossus could be kind of interesting. If I had um, been able to get flash, this deck would have looked pretty different. Um, like oh for sure yeah. It, I it obviously your selection of creatures goes correct. Obviously, yeah, you know out the window. Yep, I, I think that the deck would have been substantially better with flash, but that is what it mm -hmm. is. Um, yeah. So overall, considering you have thought about this deck a lot how do you think this version of it came out i know you said you were unhappy with a few cards i mean it would be hard for most people to believe that fable of the mirror breaker is the worst card in your deck because that card's completely bonkers i mean you'd think uh, God, you can even enlighten tutor for it busted wow. <laughs> i like this card in my deck I, first of all it never flipped which is fine um but it also sure. like the best mode on it was discard two and then draw two like i think this card actually would have been better as a faithless looting and i know that sounds insane um, but the creature is just like literally never attacked, uh, mm -hmm. and like it probably I chumped block twice. I don't know. It was like very whatever, and it cost three mana to cast. Um, yeah, I can understand that. I think this is the worst card of the deck. I don't know. Let me let me like look and actually put thought into that. Uh, Ren mm -hmm. and six got a lot of grind value. That's probably better still. Um, now, Jace the Mind Sculptor might have been grabbing... worse. That, that Jace the Mind Sculptor was probably worse than Fable, but those two are very oh, close. Wow. Jace the Mind Sculptor, how far we've fallen in only a few short years. Now, Ren and Six is just grabbing yourself fetch lands, really. I mean, you can loop beside you with it, but it's not doing anything crazy for you, yeah? Correct, yeah. It, it mostly is, uh, it's mostly just grabbing fetch lands and then pinging off uh, X1s. So, like, it killed off an Ogre mm -hmm. Bowmaster, which was convenient. Um, I don't know, it, like, it does things, but for the most part, yeah, it was just, it was just grind value off the lands, which ended up being pretty powerful, actually. Like, just being able to drop it on turn one pretty regularly and then work mm -hmm. off of there. It also meant that I basically was never missing land drops in the control matchups, and the control field was pretty wide here. So um, mm, being able sure. to just like always be slamming lands and being able to hold up a one mana blue counter spell, like I, I would just like always have a fetch line in play, which means I was always able to have like a strict serenade up when, at any point. That um, makes a lot of sense. Similarly, um, Lutri is ridiculously mana intensive, and I used it more t in this tournament. Like I probably... Put him in my hand seven times and cast him oh. at least four. It was like very oh. strong card. Absolutely beautiful. You even picked up force negation. I mean, force is yes. you know the biggest problem with them. Any of the pitch elementals, all of them, same problem. You need to have a card in your hand. But these companions give you a way to just grab that that card at any time. It's absolutely beautiful. Probably one of the more underrated aspects of you know Gigantha, Lurus, and and Lutri. Absolutely. Maybe even Yorian. Um, um, the dig I through. I, I cloned. The next question I was going to ask. Yeah, I cloned dig through time twice with Lutri over the course of the tournament, Ooh. and it was the best feeling in the world. My God. Yeah, you can't lose. Yeah. Uh, figuring out what you're going to do with your with your graveyard uh, in any of these mid range decks. You know, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you wind up with Uro, though not a very good card to oath the druids into. Sometimes you wind up through with Treasure Cruise or Reanimate. Obviously, you decided to go with dig through time. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to have an instant speed, JVP instant in speed here. waste. Uh, no, I can't run. Um, you said J JVP. Mm -hmm. yeah, I can't right. run it with oath. Not a good card with oath. Yeah. Um, and then I would say that. But like next oath of druids fuels thing. delve, right? Like it's cards nuts with delve. Eh, sure. Yeah. Totally makes sense as long as you don't uh, accidentally find yourself with an Eldrazi hitting the graveyard. Boom. Got it. Uh, nope. Uh, I had an Elmer hit the graveyard, <laughs> and in response, I dig through time. Like it oh, was fantastic. Beautiful. That's oh yeah, that's that's living the dream, right? Yep. At that point you're not even worried about decking yourself. It's so easy. It was pretty fantastic. That's great. And then obviously you have Ren and Six also that you're sort of threatening to do stuff with your graveyard. Uh, yes. Getting Actually, yourself a little extra value. It was it was discarding the Emmer Cool to a uh, Fable, because obviously Oath would have put it into play. But yeah, it was still very nice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I, and I noticed as far as like cantrips and stuff go, uh, I would think this kind of deck, uh, cantrips would be very good because you never really like uh, outside of mox draws, which are going to be you know uh, an abnormality, I would assume, mm -hmm. since you have two of them in your deck, uh, and you also need to have requisite untapped lands and your actual combo cards. I would imagine that your turn one play a lot of the time would want to be like a ponder, right? Because then you're looking for your oath, you're looking for your show and tell, you're looking for your big idiot. Um, um, but I don't. But instead, we see like no real cantrips. We see opt and brainstorm. So correct. No ponder, no preordain. Not right. It. So ponder and preordain being sorceries is a big drawback. I would have totally played a consider if there had still been it went out. Um, I'm not gonna like stoop to the level of playing a peak, but. Given how much instant speed interaction there is in this deck, I mostly just didn't want to tap out of my own turn, unless it was for something like Minsk and Boo or Oko. Um, so even on turn one and two, like this format, I, I can't tell you the number of times where somebody on turn one played a one or two drop and I strict serenaded it and it was the game, right? Like just being able to counter uh, a soul ring on turn one with uh, counter the strict serenade with the soul ring was incredibly strong. And it just... It left Sam on one land, and she just sat there drawing for four turns, and then finally drew a land in turn four. Oof, that is how a, a VRD turns against you. My yeah, God. and then she played fast spot, and there. it was like, okay, well, this, this would have been a very different <laughs> game if there had been a soul ring in play. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Pour one out for the homie. Right. Pour one out for the fast bond, too. But you know what? She deserves it for picking your saga and your alliance at MM. So, it was pretty honestly, brutal. Kind of based. And the force of negation was great. I mean, being able to pitch it was obviously fine, but also this deck largely defended on, on other people's turns. So it was a way I could tap out for one of the big stupid dummies and then on their turn, counter their thing with force of negation. So it, it was a, a safety blanket, um, given that this deck is a like mana drain you, tap out for a giant planeswalker and then hold up force of negation afterwards. Yeah, well, makes a lot of sense. Force of will must have gone pretty early in this draft. Yeah, force of will second went second. Got... Yeah. Some of the colored spell picks, I think, you know, not abnormal. Uh, Force of Will is usually a pretty pretty high contender, but Vamp Tutor, Thoughtseize Ragavan are just so weird to me. Um, um, I, I think all of those cards I are guess... defendable. I, like they're all kind of in that same like first three rounds. I'd expect. I think you could like quibble, but I don't think any of them are wrong. I think the Th Thalia is probably too early. But other than that, I think everything in the first three rounds is super defensible. You know, I say they're weird. They're not that weird. They're weird because Time Walk is available. That's really what it comes down to. Yeah, that is um, reasonable. Which is to say that none of those cards are as good as Time Walk is. Even the, even the, I mean, Brandon with the Ancient Tomb and the White Plume. I mean, my God, man, Time Walk is sitting right there. But that's okay. Uh, we all have our, our predilections. Yep. I, um, I, the card I was thinking about taking instead of Oko was actually the uh -huh. Fairy Time Reveler. I was like, I have these two mocks in. Uh -huh. Do I want to go into this? Um, do I want to pivot into a Miracles deck and take Teferi? Uh, uh -huh. And particularly a Miracles deck that uh, wins off of Cephalid Breakfast uh, would have been like, because I'm already in green, uh, I can then play Nadu and use Shuko with that. The thing that kept me away from it, I, I sat there and people were making fun of me for being a lane when I was thinking about whether to take Oko here or not. The fact that Urza Saga was already gone made me think that Sam was going to be doing the Nadu thing. So I was like, mm. I don't want to fight that battle. I'll, I'll stay away from it. And that's yeah, why I didn't take the ferry. I wonder when uh, when we're going to see people busting out the, the crazy Nadu decks. Uh, could be an interesting angle for a lot of people that like to play the the small sort of green creature combo decks. Absolutely. I think if you're in Elves, that, that's the direction to go. If you Also, if you're in Breakfast or if you have Urza Saga and Stoneforge Mystic, I think that like you do Saga, Stoneforge Mystic, and then like you have a Nadu deck, right? Probably if you can get to Fairy, that'd be ideal as well. But those those the three cards I think are your setup, and then you fall into Nadu late. Yeah, but 100%. I think the, the mono green uh, version of it's also pretty good. Sure, mono green. All you need is a bird. Yep. Um, let me ask you this: during the draft, whose decks were you concerned about? Um, obviously you have a fairly linear game plan going. You're not too worried about, oh, this person's not going to be playing any creatures in their deck. Oh, this person's going to be trying to control what I do. I mean, you're playing a fairly resilient mid rangey deck. You can fight in basically any kind of game. Uh, Absolutely. That's exactly the way I like to play. Uh, so I'm sure no one, but I mean, who was like ringing the alarm bells and telling you like, wow, I should make sure I get some sideboard cards for this person because their deck is going to crack me. So the person that I didn't think about and then lost to was Daniel. I was just like, ah, it's white creature stuff. I'll deal with it. Um, that's yeah. fine. 
Uh, ended up getting crushed. I think I mostly just drew badly. Like I don't, I don't. Sure. I don't know. I, I want to watch that match again to see if there's anything I should have been doing differently. Um, but you play seven rounds, it's bound to happen. Yeah, I don't know that. that he also played very well. Like this is like it's it's both. I drew badly and he played near perfect. Um, yeah. But Dan Dan Magnan is the is the deck that I was very scared of because it seemed like a near perfect Thassa's Oracle deck. I think if he had gone into Doomsday, it would have been even better. But I, mm. people have different opinions on that card. Uh, sure. Yeah. Let's see. Sam's deck, I think, was just like, this can do very powerful things, but I think I have most of them covered. Uh, Scott, I also, um, I was like, this deck can, can do powerful things, but it's a blue-white control deck. I feel like either I am going to be able to sneak through the counter spells, or I will get crushed under the weight of all of that control, um, which has ended up happening. Our matches there was like a three-hour long uh, incredible match that I'm excited to, to commentate later. Um, oh my God, that was one of the guys, one of the ones you guys got recorded. I'm I'm nearly positive, yeah. But it was it was oh, a it was a slug so fest. It, like it, cow, yeah. it was basically just a draw go past the turn with seven cards in hand over and over, like discarding the hand size. It was fantastic. Um, Interesting, very cool. Yeah, Brandon uh, Brandon's list I really liked, but I, obviously with Brandon I never know really what I'm expecting, so it was hard to know. Um, it's hard to know like where his deck was going to be going. Similarly with Steven. Even after just the White Plume, Fourth Year Lingus, Ancient Tomb picks, you were still just, you know, this is Brandon, he's probably going to do something weird. Yeah, I, I really, like, absolutely should have taken Hydro, or taken Hydroblast. That was the card that, I, like, as the draft ended, I was like, this is the card I'm going to miss the most. Hi. Um, Hi. <laughs> uh, this is Rory, she's saying hello. Um, Hi, Rory. But, yeah, the... I, I feel like he's the deck that I didn't draft, that I didn't pick for, that I absolutely should have. Because um, mm -hmm. it would have been very easy, too. Like, just literally, a, like, Hydro and Beb, and it would have been pretty well covered, I think. Uh, sure. Yeah, I could see that. Yes, yeah, Steven, Steven, there's, like, there's, like Agatha Soul rough... Cauldron. There's a lot of Day. things that, like, I didn't know. Uh-huh. I, I, yeah. I, I didn't know what Cody was doing. I just see a Goblin Barbarian, and I'm always scared. But, I don't know, none of these decks felt like they were attacking on an axis that I couldn't answer. Right, like, I have counter spells, and sure. that's, that is pretty well protected from most things does a lot of the work i would say i think that's kind of the beauty of of building your deck around these cards like oko and uh having a linear combo centric game plan gives you a lot of options i think what this affords you is the ability to just say i'm going to execute my game plan i'm going to do my thing whatever you guys got going on over there i have these generic counter spells these generic removal spells you don't have a lot of removal spells in your deck but Generally, that's kind of... Oh, yeah. with, enough, with enough card drawn and enough playing oh, walkers, you can day. muscle your way through most things. That's the thing, right? Like, there's Into the Flood Maw, um, and the removal spells I would need are for things that uh, that answer me, right? Like, Ember Cool is a pretty freaking good removal yeah. spell, as is Ulamog. Um, so, like, as long as I can just, like, get an Ember Cool out attacking, I, I'm not Hello. very worried about pretty much anything Hello. going on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, as far as your sideboard cards that you actually did wind up picking, you've got an Energy Flux, a Misdirection, Stern Scolding, Swan Song, Tasha's. When did you decide, or did you have a particularly strong feeling towards these sideboard cards? Were you really like determined to have these particular ones, or were they just sort of filling out? Mostly not. Uh, like Dress Down, I was very excited about because there's a lot of creature decks out there, and particularly a lot of creatures that can just like make life hard. Um, so I wanted Dress Down for sure. That's one that I, I think took pretty highly. Veil of Summer, I ran main, ran main deck. This is a card that's just like ludicrously good. Um, mm -hmm. Misdirection was one that I wanted one more force for the control matchup, and I this is the best one. Um, Energy Flux, I think, is a card that's just very good. This field wasn't very good for it, which is why I waited so long to take it. I think I took it in the 30th or something. Um, but against Dan, it's just, if you resolve it, it's very hard for him to win. Uh, yeah. Oliphant is one that I got tricked into by Steven. I don't think it's actually good in the deck, but I did end up bringing it in. I thought I was going to run it main deck, um, but thinking about hitting this off of Oath in a lot of matchups is very bad. But in something like a control matchup where I just want more threats, like, I don't care if I... if Like, I ended up killing in that format, in the in the control uh, mirror with Lutri twice. So it's just like, beating down with Lutri is, is the game plan in that kind of world. Oathing into an Oliphant is perfectly reasonable. Um yeah. Yeah. There's some allure to having creatures in your in your combo decks. There's something alluring, and I say this all the time. I feel like it's probably my catchphrase at this point. But when the fail state of your cards are that you can just beat your opponent to death with them, right? I feel like you have such an edge. Uh, VRD is like this format where people are killing each other on like turn two. All this craziness is happening, and 
an equal number of the games end with people just draw, yeah. go, draw, go, draw, go. It's a slap fest after laying on the attack ground. Attack you for two, attack you for two. Uh, <laughs> we blew all of our stuff on turns one and two. Both of us are still alive, and now we have to figure out how the game's going to end. And in that kind of situation, you know, if you're... If your card is Oliphant versus Emrakul the Aeon's Torn, one of those cards can really come down and end the game, uh, practically. Absolutely. Well, and that's where something like Tasha's Hideous Laughter is for that exact same situation, right? It's like, this card isn't ever going to mill somebody out, but there's there are a two of the decks in the field that um, are very A and B, and if you can just Tasha's and rip apart their deck, they're both A and B and also low mana curves. So uh -huh. um, that's what that came in for. Vaccine Bobble was pretty weak. Uh, I brought it in in a couple matchups, but I think it was largely a mistake. Um, I, I, it's like, a little too specific, I think. It's a it bit is. of a bummer that you can't cash out that card without losing your little, you know, quote-unquote hate piece. Yeah, I, th I think it's, like, a perfectly fine card. Uh, I don't yeah. think this is the deck for it, necessarily. But it was, it was. I think, it could have been useful. It, it's also really low impact, <laughs> so it's, like, the biggest impact is that you waste a pick on it. So. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. So, were there any, you told us, obviously, about your uh, several hour long slugfest with, you said it was... Uh, this was Scott in the, the blue-white control Scott. list. Yeah. Uh, and then it looks like you, your other losses came to Dan. You said you didn't really have a lot of sideboard stuff. And, of course, the yeah, winner of the day. Dan juked me out, actually. So, so I lost I lost to oh, wait, Dan. both Dans. Yeah, I lost to both Dans. So I lost to Daniel Cardno uh, on, he, like just got his white creatures and I couldn't stop them. Um, and I couldn't yeah. find a combo, which is like, fine, that happens. Uh, against Daniel Magnan, he juked me out with, uh, he baited with the Grim Monolith, I think it was. Well, he had a key in play already. So I countered it because I just couldn't let that happen. Um, I think that there's like a lot of ways to think about what happened. And I think I made the wrong play thinking back on it. It's hard to like not look with uh, hindsight, but I think it was the mm -hmm. wrong play yeah. even with that. Um, and then the other two matchups were very much like one of them. I got him without him being able to interact, and that one he got me without him being able to interact. Uh, walking into the match though in game one, I think I probably made a mistake in game one where I underestimated how fast he can win from nothing, from like literally a swamp and play. Uh, mm. So I, I like in game game one, I think I really made bad mistakes. Uh, game three, I think I just got got and like he outplayed me. But in game one, I think I just fundamentally misunderstood the matchup. So. Like, I was yeah, just a straight-up yeah. control deck as opposed to trying to be an interactive deck. Right. And that does kind of make sense. He does have a more sort of immediate combo. His combo will literally win him the game, whereas yours will put a big guy into play. Correct. Um, and sort of give your opponent a... I, I always like to say um, the Storm decks of, of the, a bygone era of Cube Draft, y you used to sort of hang out and you would wait until your opponent was about to kill you then you would finally try to go off. Yes, Whereas like the nowadays, reset tide you kind of, of just try to go off as soon as you can because there's too much interaction in the game. There's too many ways to just die on the spot. It, it, nowadays, Storm in Cube feels a lot more like uh, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm trying to go off as soon as possible as opposed to just waiting until you're actually dead. Yep. Um, giving your opponent that little heads up like, hey, by the way, next turn, you're going to die, so you better go for it. Um, certainly not the most immediate combo. There are are some combos with Lutri, aren't there? Like dual cast or something? No, Probably. he's a legendary. That doesn't work. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm sure there is something, but uh, I was I thinking know. dual cast mage. They're like quote unquote combos with it, but uh, also a matchup against Cody is fun to watch. In that I drop an Oath of Druids on turn two, two games in a row, and then the game ends. Um, which is like beautiful. It's it's a nice little that. fifteen minute match we can have up there soon. I I was gonna ask, were there any of the obviously those were your losses and, and lots of things to think about in retrospect, but then were any of your dubs particularly exciting or were they all pretty rote? Let's see. So I, I straight up can't beat Brandon ever, uh just in any format. Um that's not true. I think we're like roughly <laughs> even, but yeah, it feels that way. Yeah. Um Dan and Dan I feel that way about. too, and I think I beat him all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh the match against Sam, her deck didn't perform. The match against Scott was incredible. Slugfest. Uh, Cody was like a fun little, like just me going off twice in a row. Uh, and against Steven, it was a pretty close match. That one's not a camera. Um, but it was a lot mm -hmm. of just kind of like me controlling the board um, while he was trying to put things together and then eventually just getting him. So, uh, it, yeah, like, I got to say, Steven's not a bad player. And for him to go zero and seven is. Yeah probably a little below expectation even if his deck he said he wasn't super thrilled with his deck 
I would expect that in the seven rounds you're probably running a little bit below average if uh, if you can't pick up any wins. Yeah, um, I mean he he bitter ordealed me, but only had four, and just like I had five five targets, so he like got 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 there a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, th yeah, I think largely this the deck just kind of like didn't perform, and that's I, I think uh like he tried for a strategy that I don't know. You should interview him and talk about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hey, I. Uh, I appreciate anyone who's willing to push the limits and test out some Absolutely. new things. And that includes when you're testing out new things for you, by the way, you know, because yep. uh, as much fun as it is to play rug midrange, <laughs> it's cool uh, to branch out and play some different decks. Yes. Uh, I don't think fun. I... It, Do you, yeah. Are you, are you excited to draft this particular archetype in the future? Is this like a, a well you think you'll be coming back to, or do you want to get back to your storm cards? Um, I definitely want to get back to storm if it's available, but I also recognize that it won't always be. I think Oath of Druids is a card that I want to explore more. Um, I don't know exactly which direction to go with it. I think Sneak Attack, this has taught me, is Sneak Attack is just not a very good card. Uh, similarly, like why I don't like the big green decks, it's just it requires running too many cards that when you draw them do nothing. Um, mm -hmm. So like, I can't tell you how many games I sat there with Gristlebrand just sitting in my hand, and mm -hmm. other games where I sat there with Sneak Attack and it basically was a glorified bait spell because I never had anything to back it up with. So mm -hmm. I don't. I want to draft fewer cards like that. As opposed to like Show and Tell, where Show and Tell, uh, like, for some reason just lined up better i think it's just because it costs two less mana um it's just mm -hmm. substantially better uh so yeah i, th I think i want to come back to oath of Druids and explore it a little more i think there's like potential for very good creatureless strategies and even if it's just oath of druids in a storm deck or something like i think that there's a lot of potential there uh i don't know exactly what it looks like yet but there's something there okay i know we're about at our time limit but i do have one more question for you mm -hmm. real quick um and that is just uh Hold on, wait. I'm thinking of it. We can edit this part out. Uh, I just had it in my head. Fuck. Hold on. I'm leaving the silence so we can find it. Yeah. <laughs> Shit. I was literally thinking this for like two minutes. Fuck. I asked you about if you wanted to go back to playing Storm afterwards. And then the follow-up question was, nope, I lost it. Doomsday, uh, play another one. It, it, it had something to do with like what you wanted to play for future VRDs, but I'm I literally I didn't write it down because I've been only thinking of it for like hey. the last three minutes. So stupid. Colors double <laughs> moxin. Like, yeah, I don't know. Um, no, it was it was something stupid. I think it was okay. it was just like uh, it was something. Yeah, it was something to do with like. What kind of decks do you are you excited about drafting going forward? Um, or if oh yeah, yeah yeah that's probably it. Okay let me so let me yep. line it up here. So we'll give it a little moment of silence here. Work in the edit. So what kind of decks are you don't uh, participate in every St. Lotus draft because obviously Rarely. you are our wonderful host and and commentator. Uh, so given the fact that you don't get to get out for every draft, are there any decks you're really really excited about playing the next time you get a chance to sit down at the table yeah so i mean I, I think returning to kind of the list of things that i was excited about drafting for this one it's still true um like there is a stifle knot list that i feel like i'm really amped about i don't know exactly what it looks like but being able to run to fairy time reveler uh dreadnought and then as well as some of these new cards that have been coming in with that, like doorkeeper thrall um mm. and being able to null drifter along with Phyrexian dreadnought that, that's one deck that's very much in my head Another one is mm -hmm. this uh, mono red Ruby Storm. I I played just like Goldfish this one for about two hours the night before. I was just so jazzed about it, and it it has legs. I'm really excited about this one. Uh, and then the deck that I've literally had sitting here for five years is uh, a, a, like effectively a port over of um, of an eight mulch list. Uh, so being able to run Winding Way and mulch along with just kind of like grind to the ground pox style uh, green black nonsense in a, in a land strategy so not turbo lands but being able to just like liliana the veil and then mulch your way through the game so those mm, are kind of the three that are that. very high up there there's also some food God, chain I, lo I love new green black deck i think there's a food chain nonsense with, with this new um glaring flesh raker card like that card Ooh, just yeah. seems mm -hmm. nuts um so i'm, I, I'm excited I talked to see to a few that people one who are excited about that card so uh, it's going to be interesting when that one finally pops off and we see some people going crazy with it flesh yeah raker. The, the, the classic a, problem a though near you food chain if you remember its type on the line it says enchantment so that's that's a hard one to make work again mm, 
true, true. So, but, but you can uh, just play an Eldrazi oh, aggro deck and happen to win. That, that's the idea for this one. There you go. Genius. Brilliant. Voice of a Generation. Mark Hatford. Cool. Thank you very much for talking to me about the draft, Mark. Yeah, absolutely. And, this is a great time. Uh, nice job. Next time, I'm sure you'll get them. Yeah, I mean, I still got prizes. I got into the top four, so that's, that's okay. That's, really, that's what I like to hear. What did you uh, wind up walking away with? So we, for these friends and family ones, instead of doing a big bottles of liquor, we everyone brings seven uh, EDH playable cards and you sign them and have a big like VRD written on them. So it's almost like a scribble ante where you you ah, and your opponent awesome. pick a card and then you play for those cards. Uh, so it, it ends awesome. up, Holy yeah, God. it's a lot of fun. Um, so I ended up with a like a stack of I think seven or eight lands is what I drafted at the end because the person who wins gets one of the two cards, the other ones go into the prize pool. So. If you, mm -hmm. you basically Very get one cool. for every win, and then if you make it to the top, you get a big stack of extra cards. And tokens from all of your wonderful friends. Isn't yeah. that sweet? It's a great. And, and now, now it's starting to get to the point where there's like some that are triple and quadruple signed, and those are the, the really high valuable ones. <laughs> People wanting the cards that have been That's previously funny. signed. Nothing better than, than spoils of war. Exactly. Absolutely. All right, well, well, thank you very much, Mark. Have a nice night. Yeah, good chatting with you. Take it easy. Can't Bye. wait.